Yes, yes. Uh, this is the final part of our program, and uh, I'd like to introduce once more Diana, David, and Lavinia, who led the brilliant, amazing conversations for two days. Uh, it was a great work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And now we have now we have a chance to ask some questions to Lavinia for the first time. Uh, uh, I think uh, there would be many questions from the audience, uh, but uh, first of all, our discussion uh, is called How Music Shapes Us. Uh, the music, as we know, has a great power of shaping us as persons, uh, a great uh, power of transforming and changing the lives and the minds. But uh, also music, uh, in a certain sense, uh, is forming and transforming our creative work, uh, even if it's not connected with the music as itself. And uh, today we'd like to talk about the different connections of music and the creative work, the writing, uh, the, uh, uh, the poetry and prose. Uh, and the work of our guests. And first of all, I'd like to ask you, uh, first of all, I'd like to sit down. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask all of you, uh, can you remember the music which influenced uh, your writing in terms of style and in terms of general approach to art? Uh, not only uh, the music that you loved or you listened to uh, in different times, but music that uh, uh, could be the uh, pattern uh, uh, of creative work that you followed. Lavinia, Lavinia. Lavinia. <laughs> okay, I suppose I'd, I'd like to be cool and say punk rock. Mm. You know, oh. formed me. But I suspect, I suspect it was probably more general sort of pop. Um, uh, I think many things have. I think, I think punk rock gave me, uh, or it expressed for me, an aesthetic that was against sweetness and uh, femininity and, uh, and neatness. I, you know, and, and my, I am quite a um, I, don't know quite, I, I get called cool and precise is how I get described. It's not at all how I feel. So, so um, I think part of the culture around that, the subcultures of music through the late 70s and early 80s formed my writing aesthetic and my concerns. But I think that other forms of music, I, I played the piano a lot. Um, on my own, badly, for hours and hours and hours. And I think discovering the architecture of a sonata and what it meant to have a refrain and a motif and the, the, you know, feeling music, actually, the architecture of music, I think was very informative to me in terms of the musical tensions in my own work. Diana? Uh, there was actually many different um, forms of music. I, I grew up with lots of music around me, um, soul and um, reggae, uh, reggae probably most of all, um, hip hop when I went into my teens and I was also in an orchestra, I used to play the oboe in an orchestra. I remember my dad playing hymns, um, carols at Christmas and I think all of that um, sort of melded into the way I approach writing. I've always loved poetry and uh, the, the natural rhythm and musicality of poetry. And I think that seeps into the way I write. I'm always um, trying to achieve rhythm in my writing. I'm, I'm focusing on the way the sentences flow into one another rather than the um, pursuing of, of a story. It's more about the rhythm of the language. So um, I think music is just a very important um, part of the, the source of my writing. David, and uh, you was a musician uh, for many years, and 
Uh, did your experience as a musician uh, influence your experience as a writer? Uh, how does it connect? Mm, no. I, I think it influenced my music criticism because I think it's quite good if you've not only can you play an instrument, if you've been in the back of a van and gone on tour and been in the studio and know how to use a port of studio and have pumped cassettes and printed posters, you're kind of aware of how the mechanics. But in terms of um, my um, influence on my writing, it would definitely be free jazz and improvisation because that's kind of how I work as a writer. When I start my book, I sort of hit the ground running. I have a title or a first sentence and I, I kind of see that almost as the head you know, the theme, I sort of bang the first sentence down and then I'm unraveling that sentence for the next little bit and I'm creating it sentence by sentence so I'm chasing the theme, you know, like it's like softness that I riff into a soul and then I come back to the head a little bit and also, it just gave me the, 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 the belief that you can spontaneously create you know, that they can just come out and also that you can, sp you can spontaneously generate form that matches you what I really love about free jazz is how you think it's free jazz, it's improvised music, it would all just be a big bad noise. But the, the best free jazz players have a real thumbprint, a real fingerprint. John Coltrane, Peter Brotsman, you know, all that sort of stuff. So that was a massive influence in me, the sort of instant creation. And it sort of got over, it helped me get over the sort of fear of approaching the, how, how, do, how do you approach the blank page? How, how do you start? You know? Well, you have the ground running, you bang, you drop a table, and you start riffing. The free jazz is uh, not only music, it's also sometimes it's almost a uh, spiritual practice. Uh, a certain state of mind uh, uh, which allows you to, uh, to, uh, to approach this spontaneity, to be naive as you told yes. earlier. Yes? And uh, uh, for you, what's this state of mind and how, you, how do you achieve it? The state of mind when I'm writing is somewhere between like uh, something like demonic possession a little bit. I definitely feel that I'm a sort of conduit um, and I'm not sure where it's coming from. I mean, um, Fiona talked earlier on about how uh, Hildegard of Bingen said that she was directly inspired by God. Well, I know the feeling. I, I don't know if I'm going to call it God or a holy guardian angel or, or, um, or, an, or I'll take from another fiction writer like Freud, the unconscious. You can call it all these different things, but when I'm writing at my best, I tend to sit at the desk and I wait and I listen. And when I recognize that voice that is not me speaking, I start to take dictation. And I do see it as spiritual practice because it's been a revelation to me that there are other voices speaking and you are able to be a conduit or a channel. And quite often when I write my books, I read them back and I'm like, holy shit, who wrote that? It certainly was not me. Or was not me, you know? Diana, uh, you've told today that uh, uh, you think about, you imagine what music uh, to your characters love. And uh, do you... Uh, what part of the music play in your creative process? Do you hear music while writing? Do you imagine what music sounds uh, in different episodes of your uh, novels or... Uh, uh. It's not really, um, it's not really an, an intentional um, thing, or it's even an explicit thing. It's, it's, it's just that music is so much a part of us, and I, I'm writing about human beings and um, human experience, and music is so deeply tied in with that. So, so there's always a musical presence in there, and uh, I do tend, as I'm writing, to. A project does tend to develop its own natural soundtrack and theme songs that I, I um, when I hear them, it it immediately connects me to the work and makes the work seem possible. Because often the work doesn't seem possible; it feels difficult, uh, and music always makes it flow, always makes it feel easy. Your process actually really terrifies me. I just cannot imagine writing in that way, just not knowing where I'm going. I, I, need, um, I need structures in place and I need um, frameworks in place and, and the music helps me um, sort of keep faith in that structure and, and keep aiming for that structure. But something has to be there already and, and music kind of holds my hand through it and helps me keep the thread. Lavinia, and what about you? 
uh, what about your creative process? Uh, uh, does it have any uh, musical element in it? And uh, do you hear music behind your texts, behind your poems? Uh, I don't hear other music behind my poems. I'm listening to the music that's emerging out of the poem, and I would say that music is there from the first phrase. I can't sit down and say, I'm going to write a sonnet. If it were a sonnet, it would be telling me that. Um, I would discover that, and then I'd get quite worried <laughs> about what to do next. But I think my process um, is, in a way, a combination of what's being described. Um, and I suspect within each of you it's a combination of knowing and not knowing as it go, as it evolves. Um, I, I listen, as David says, I listen. Um, and it's the, it's the unthinking and the kind of, those voices coming from elsewhere which picks up on something Glyn was just saying about how rhyme and form gave him sort of a way of escaping himself because people think we're writing because you know we want to express ourselves and it's not that we actually want to escape ourselves um we're trying to make sense of the world we're trying to translate the world but we're not trying to express ourselves um so so but i, I do have music um soundtracks that emerge around uh, my novels um i have one novel for which there is one track and it's Thelonious Monk's version of Honeysuckle Rose. And this novel is set in London at the turn of the 21st century. And it just, there's something about, well, we, you know about Monk's dilapidations, and there is something about the way that he disorganizes and reorganizes the structure of a very sweet song that really spoke to me then. So it, it does, yeah, it helps, but it's not, for me, it's not part of thing, the thing. But, um, but like Diana, I think the way to get to the next sentence is music um, rather than sense. Yeah. I'd like to ask you uh, not about the creative method, but about your uh, about your life, uh, about your musical experience uh, uh, that was important in your life. And sometimes uh, uh, the uh, music uh, that uh, makes us strong this impression in our lives it's the music that we hear in our teenage years uh, what music played a crucial part in your formative years uh, for david uh, the music that listened to the uh, characters in the memorial device and this is memorial device is it uh, uh, the most important music to you as well yes it definitely is. I mean, it, it completely, one of the characters in the book says that when he encountered that kind of music, it didn't so much change his life as it deformed it permanently. And um, that's what happened to me. My life was permanently deformed by the encounter with this type of music. And I, I mean, I can remember the month and the year, it was April 1987. And I didn't know anyone that liked weirdo music except myself. I'd started discovering it through reading about it, funnily enough, and not hearing it. I read fanzines because I always liked DIY publications and I read about groups that were happening near me in Glasgow, a group called the Pastels, a group called the Vaselines, and I thought, well, this is happening very near me, I can witness this. So there was a concert, a club called Fury Muddies, April of 1987. I didn't, I'd never been to a gig and I had no idea what happened at gigs. So I asked my dad, my dad who was pre-rock and roll, no idea what happened to gigs himself, and he said to me, well, people will sit at tables, and they'll wear suits, and then the band will come on. So I borrowed a suit from my dad, my dad drove me, <laughs> I mean, I still actually do wear the suit jacket to these days, and now I think it's cool, but um, he drove me to the venue, I walked in, dressed in my father's suit, and as soon as I opened the door, I was like, Oh shit, <laughs> everyone looks like they're in the Ramones, except me, you know? And worse than that, my dad was so concerned about me that he drove back to the venue, paid in himself, and as I was standing down the front looking cool, I felt a tap on my shoulder, and it was my dad giving me a coke. He then climbed on stage, sat beside the bouncer on stage and told the bouncer to make sure I was okay in the front row. I mean, it was a lovely experience, you know? But um, it changed my life forever because I looked around at everyone else and that night when I went home, 
I stood in front of the mirror and I messed up my hair because my hair was always quite neatly combed and I decided I will never comb my hair again. And I never have. <laughs> Diana, uh, can you remember such a strong musical experience? Uh, uh, the music that made a great impression on you in your teenage years? I did say before that it wasn't one particular artist, there were, there were a few of them. I, um, I was crazy about Prince and Maxi Priest. I had huge crushes on both of them. I also had a huge crush on Marty Pello from Wet Wet Wet. Um, and, I, I, and my friends often say that I have really bad taste in music because I, I have this very um, eclectic way of listening to music. From one minute I listen to a folk song and Next minute, I'll, I'll listen to a really hardcore Public Enemy song, and but that, that's the way I, that's the way I came across music from a very young age. It was always lots of different things influencing me, but and, but it also seemed to be very connected with the idea of romance. I was I was in love with the with the musicians that I listened to as well. Um, I had a similar experience to David. Only my dad didn't turn up. Um, I, I'm so touched by your father doing that, it's just yeah, really lovely. Um, my father did other helpful things, but he didn't turn up at gigs. Um, I, when I was 15, I dragged a couple of friends to see the Vibrators at the Marquee Club in London. Um, and I still have, the, you had to, it was because of licensing, you had to pay a pound and become a member. And I still have the card. And I was so childish at the time, so childlike, I mean, that I did little circles over the eyes in my name. And it looks, look, looks like a 12-year-old signature. And we went into the club, and one of my friends uh, was an American I'd gone to primary school with who was visiting with her family and met up with me, and she was just paralyzed and shell-shocked. And my other friend um, pulled a copy, to my embarrassment, of Herman Hesse's Siddhartha out of her pocket and went, she hated the noise so much, she went and sat in the corridor um, and read Siddhartha. <laughs> and I stood there and looked about me and the first thing I thought is everyone is wearing bin liners and I'm wearing jeans. And that was when I knew I had to stop wearing jeans. But what was more, more the more profound influence um, was the, the total aesthetic shift I made in a moment it felt like. So I could stop being this thing I was bad at being, I didn't really want to be, and here was possibility and so on. And, and what was so extraordinary about the gig, I had been to see bands before, but they'd been quite, quite theatrical, conventional performances, whereas the vibrators were barely on stage and the audience and band, you couldn't really tell them apart, and it wasn't a performance. It, there was, it was just music, it was just noise. And I loved it. And I went out at the end and said to my friend, are you all right? And she said, someone's just puked on Herman Hess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, guess, I guess Punk did kind of puke on Herman Hess. <laughs> the music, I think any music, is connected to different forms of art. Uh, and. Uh, for you, uh, was the music uh, a tool of expanding your cultural horizon? Uh, did it bring with it uh, a new literature, a new art, uh, a new, uh, new people with new experience? Um, yes. uh, I don't know um, which came first, really. I feel like there was a total moment that David so brilliantly describes in this as moral device where we were listening to punk, we were re-arguing about philosophy, we were reading foreign novels, we were going to see art. You know, I would sort of turn up with my pink hair dripping, but looking really seriously at pictures. We, were, we had such an appetite for the wider world and wider experience and wider thought. You know, Britain in the 70s was not a place that was comfortable with either glamour, ambition, or serious thought let alone serious thought about art, that the word pretentious was heard a lot. Um, and so for me, as David descri has described, it was a total culture. 
Yeah, totally, it was for me as well. And I, I totally agree with you, Lavinia, I can't remember what came first. It was this kind of explosive moment where everything changed. And you were reading, and you wanted to produce, you wanted to participate and take part in the culture. And the culture seemed, made it seem possible. One of the great, when I go back to that concert, one of the revelatory things about that concert was, I had never seen a band on stage, as you said, it looked like the audience, but also they couldn't really play with great technical proficiency, which made it seem within my grasp to do the same. And it seemed that this music made demands of you. You could not be a passive consumer of this music. To participate in the culture, you had to contribute to the culture. And to contribute to the culture would also mean being able to take part in the discussions that the culture at large were having. And the discussions that they were having would often be about Russian novels, philosophy, socialism, nihilism, Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, all that sort of stuff. Even like comic books, science fiction, all these different things. Exploring all the different ways of transforming your immediate reality, you know. And I would see, and this is Memorial Device, I have this phrase, it's not easy being Iggy Pop in Airdrie. And it certainly is harder being Iggy Pop in Airdrie than it is being Iggy Pop. So these people who dared to walk down these bland, small suburban towns in the dull 1970s, wearing guys wearing silver lamy leggings and Cuban high heels and eyeliner and flagrantly smoking drugs with, you know, a copy of an Albert Camus book in their pocket. They seemed heroic. Not just that, they were almost like martyrs for the culture because you really risked life and limb in Airdrie doing that. But it seemed so brave and glorious. I wanted to be as brave and as glorious as these people that I saw enacting the culture on the high street. It was almost like the avant-garde had invaded working class culture. It was absolutely electrifying. The political and social ideas that stand behind the music uh, is it important for you as a listener and as a writer? Uh, Diana? Yeah, I, I definitely connect with what <laughs> you were just saying because um, it, when I was listening to um, like, bands like Tribe Called Quest and Public Enemy and NWA and just the, the political force and uh, that idea of um, really crucial expression and of, of one's existence, having, having to fight for one's very existence. Uh, that really had a deep impact on my reading life. And um, I was reading writers like Tony Morrison and Alice Walker in my late teens at the same time as I was listening to these rappers. And, and it, it gave me this, um, I don't know, a, a sense of direction and the idea that I was fighting for something that was much bigger than I was and and that there was something that was very important in my writing that was to do with uh, express, expressing the existence of my community and and it did go right back into um, the history of, of black struggle and right back to slavery. I, th I feel that even now in my writing there are um, there is meaning in terms of what black suffering has meant through the generations and that the music and the, the literature are so deeply connected there. It's, it's just, it's an essential part of what I write, I think. But it's, but it's also, um, the, the, the artistry of it is just as important as the politics. Uh, about the social... About political and social right. ideas that music... Is yeah, well, we thought we could change the world. Um, we thought we could ban the bomb. We thought we could save the whale. We thought we could get Thatcher out. That took a while, but we did it. Um, uh, I would go on marches all the time, absolutely believing that we could make change. And it was music that made me think it was possible and, and music um, feeling like a collective experience as well as an intensely personal experience. It gave me people to be with, as did books. Um, I don't, I don't think, you know, this is a strange thing to say, but I don't think we were wrong. And do you think music nowadays, music uh, at this moment, still has this power, uh, the power to 
uh, change the society, to change the things around us. Because uh, uh, when you say, uh, of course, we'll bend the bomb, we'll save the whale, we'll see all the uh, uh, major artists uh, on major labels uh, 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 constantly uh, trying to save just another whale or another African country. But uh, uh, is it, does it make sense? Uh, is, is, is it possible uh, now for some music to bring such changes? Uh, so I itself? think so, because you know, music is massively industrialized and commercialized and posthumized, um, but it is also incredibly uncontrollable and it gets under your skin and it gets in your head and you don't, um, you absorb things passively and if people are, you know, the, the, the simple protest songs that have evolved um, in recent responses to say the shootings in America, um, the just different things that, that have become the, the, the most direct and succinct expression um, of what's going on. They, they do, I think they have, they take on their own lives and they, they make their own way and, and people who don't want to hear them end up hearing them. That's not to say they have immediate effects, but I trust their power. David, what do you think? I, I mean, I mean, this is probably quite a controversial opinion, but um, I, I always hated Bono and I always hated like Live Aid and him banging on it and Sting banging on about the rainforest and all this crap. I just thought they were really uncool. But now it seems like everyone wants to be Bono. You know, everyone wants to be Sting. And I kind of want somebody with, I, I want a rock star with no social conscience whatsoever. That would be really refreshing. You know, I mean, someone like Iggy Pop, who just turns up, takes his top off, smears himself with peanut butter and dives head first into a gang of Hell's Angels. You know? So I'd like to see a bit less social conscience sometimes, you know? No, I, I agree. I think I, it, it, I didn't like songs about, you know, and actually it was my hippie brother who was saving the whale. I wasn't saving the whale, I was banning the bomb. Um, <laughs> and he was upstairs with a centre party and long hair and listening to Gong, and I was downstairs with, um, yeah, punks. Um, no, I agree with that, and, um, and I think it is awful. Do you know that story about Bono clapping at Live Aid? So he clapped and he said, every time I clap, a child is dying in Africa, and someone shouted, stop fucking clapping. <laughs> so do you think that, uh, in, in general, the, uh, the best years uh, in the history of popular music, uh, uh, the uh, the time when it has this transformative and liberating power, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and so on, uh, maybe this time is over. Uh, uh, does the music still has the same force for some uh, people in some aspects? I think different music does. I think hip-hop and rap took, took on the political mantle, and that's where you get the most politically powerful and engaged stuff. Yeah. I, I think that there are revolutionary periods, and there are moments, and what always interests me are those little periods of flux when something has happened, what is happening that hasn't been named or fully defined yet, and I love that. You know, it's only in retrospect we even use terms like post-punk, because it wasn't called post-punk at the time because no one knew what it was. It was so wide-ranging and new and exciting. And I think there are constantly revolutionary periods just before something has been fully formalized or articulated. You know, you have rock and roll in the 50s, you have psychedelic rock in the 60s, you have punk in the 70s. So I think there are always these revolutionary moments, these little periods of flux, and these are the moments that always really excite me when things don't quite have a name yet. Yeah, I think there's always a tendency to, to, to talk about the end of protest and the, the, the end of um, political gestures in art, but I think they're always there and I think that's part of the reason for art, that's why it's so important and particularly music because it's so, um, it's so esoteric and, and um, it can express so much, it's often un unvocal. Uh, 
and, and it, it can be very dangerous as well. Music has such power. Look at the, um, the chanting that took place at the Trump rally the other day, send her back. That, that just shows how powerful music can be, that idea of, of um, repetition and that intrinsic um, politicism and influence. And that exists in, in music, you know, just by its nature, especially for folk music and hip hop, and uh, and lots of reggae music is still very political. I don't think music is ever going to come to the end of its politicism because it's just part of music. Uh, we talked yesterday about epiphanies, and uh, can you tell us about your personal musical epiphanies, the moment when uh, you felt uh, the music as a kind of revelation that's changing your life at this moment. Yes. Loving you. <laughs> I, well, I think, um, I, I think again, the idea of something changing your life is something you see in quite long retrospect. So I couldn't say that certain moments changed my life, but um, I can think of moments where I felt that I was having a very powerful sense of illumination that would profoundly change me. Um, uh, but they, they are vary from uh, the Janáček opera Janufa, which I saw probably 15 years ago, and there was something about, like, you know, based on a very ancient story and these, these archetypes, this elemental drama being played out and something about the perfect marriage of words, music and theatre um, made me see the possibilities of actually high artfulness and I use the word artfulness in a positive sense, I think artfulness and artifice are often considered negative things, whereas actually, you know, this is art, it's contrived, it's constructed. Um, and that's what we do in order to, live, to deliver a visceral truth. And I think that kind of experience, seeing something like that, made me realize that, that I could trust the artfulness of art to enable me to tell a greater truth. I touched on this a little bit when I was talking to Lavinia the other day. I was initiated really into sort of underground culture and music by girls. Um, particularly two girls who lived in Eardry. I replied to an ad for somebody looking for cassettes because I saw they worked in Eardry. I didn't have any cassettes, I just wanted to meet people who, who um, liked music. And um, it, it was an initiation in so many ways. And there's a lot of sex in, in memorial device because I think discovering your own sexuality and having permission to express your own sexuality goes hand in hand with that liberating moment of discovering culture. And I always remember um, the two girls, um, um, they invited me over to their house. Their mom, I, was, I was probably about 16 and they were in their early 20s and they seemed impossibly sophisticated to me. They had black eyeshadow and they dressed all in black and looked one of their boyfriends kicked about Eardry with a Russian communist era hat and a big fur coat and a beard looking like a madman and I was kind of in awe of this guy and we went back to the girl's house and they put on a Velvet Underground compilation and I'd never heard this before and it's songs about heroin and things and I was like oh my god these girls are listening to songs about heroin and stuff and I always remember as we walked through the kitchen heroin on in the background there was a breakfast bar in the kitchen of a place we sit and have your breakfast and one of the girls casually said I fucked my boyfriend on that breakfast bar yesterday and I remember me thinking oh my god she has sex on a breakfast bar these people are like outlaws you know so this was the moment it was, it was more than even just music the soundtrack was there but it was an initiation in this impossibly exciting and dangerous world you know I find it very hard to think of a particular moment where I've had a musical epiphany because they, they just, I, I'm always having musical epiphanies, but I, I do remember being, my, my breath being taken away by a scene, um, Bolero being performed by an orchestra when I was very young. I was, I was a teenager and, and I'm, I've never been very well versed in classical music. But uh, the, just the experience of watching the creation of sound like that so immediately and, um, and the way it builds up 
from from a, a place of such quietitude to this 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 crashing, deafening noise. It had a huge impact on me in terms of um, the possibilities in music and the very act of creation and the thrill of, of watching something being materialized in that way. It was amazing. Uh, can I come back? Um, there was uh, David's story reminded me of a very the opposite almost, which is an experience of young men and young women together in a room alone, but just listening. There's, there's a wonderful play by Jim Cartwright called Road, and there's a scene in Road where two boys and two girls are in a room and they sit apart and they're listening to Otis Redding's Trial of Tenderness and they're drinking and nothing happens but everything happens. That's, that's what it is. And I, it particularly spoke to me because when I was 14, a friend of mine was going out with a boy whose big brother had gasped, left home and had his own flat, which was an extraordinary thing. And we went round to his flat and he was earning good money. I think he was slightly crooked and didn't ask too much about what he was doing. But he had he had outfitted a white room with a white shag pile carpet. So you've got this. And, and he bought the most amazing stereo. And I'd never heard records on a good stereo. And we sat, um, this is years before the place, so we weren't in it, but we sat, the four of us, separately, just naturally sat down. And it was my first experience, and he put on Earth, Wind and Fire, That's the Way of the World, which is a track I want played at my funeral, as my family know. Um, and it was an absolutely transformative experience of simply listening. Nothing else happened. The music didn't change the world. It didn't save me. I, I didn't change. And yet I understood what it could be like just to listen. I'd like to ask you about uh, not uh, only the musicians, but also the, uh, about the people writing about music. Uh, uh, who's the best music critic? <laughs> Easy. You. <laughs> who's the best music critic after you? Uh, uh, what um, authors, what magazines, what books about music uh, changed your perception of music? Uh, what texts about music was important for you? Diana. Oh, well, I just read a really amazing book that I reviewed um, for the Financial Times by a, a jazz writer called Kevin Lejeune. He, he writes about jazz, but um, also soul and, and other forms of black music, but uh, specifically about jazz. But he's written this incredible history of Black British music, and it's in two volumes. Um, I've just read the first volume, I think he's working on the second volume, but it just has um, an incredible scope. Um, it goes uh, right back to the, um, the beginnings of the black presence in Britain uh, in the courts, and, and, and it goes right through to, to Windrush and uh, the development of different forms of music like bebop and um, reggae and and he talks about the, America, the black American musical scene and the impact that had in Britain and just the scope of it was so huge. So, that, so it has this incredible historical knowledge but there's um, a very special way that he writes about music. He describes music so beautifully and that's a really hard thing to do, to, to describe music. Um, and so yeah, I'd really, really recommend that book. I mean, for me, hands down, the greatest rock critic of the 20th century is Lester Banks. And an and encounter with Lester, this was a life, earth-shattering, life-changing moment for me in 1988, when a collection of his writing came out called Psychotic Reactions and Carburetor Dung. Banks was, a, was an American writer, he wrote for magazines like Cream. If you've ever seen a film called Almost Famous by Cameron Crowe, someone actually plays Lester Bangs in that film. And um, his writing was just, I liked his writing. I liked reading about the music that he wrote about as much as I liked listening to it. And the thing about Bangs was, and I, this is what inspired me to write about music, but I never thought of myself as a critic because I wasn't really there to criticize. I thought of myself as an evangelist. 
and I wanted to write pieces that were the equal of music, that had the same appeal and captured the same energy of the music that I was listening to. And that's what Lester Bangs did. He wrote with an incredible energy, an incredible facility for language, and he wrote about rock music as if his life depended on it. It was literally as serious as your life. And that absolutely blew me away and made me want to write about music. And I still think Psychotic Reactions is probably in my top 10 books of all time. And I must have read it 40 to 50 times. I can quote parts of it verbatim. Amazing writing. Um, when I was a teenager, um, my parents very kindly got the New Musical Express delivered to the house for me. So I read that avidly every week. And my father, who, neither of my parents, annoyingly, they were not, not shocked at all by my pink hair and my plastic trousers. They just kind of passed the gravy, you know. <laughs> they just, um, and they were very tolerant. But the one thing my father couldn't bear was the prose in the New Musical Express. He'd pick it up and say, this is just such bad writing. Um, and in many instances, he was right. I mean, there was this liberation of the music review um, and music criticism into this kind of, this writing that pulled quite unselfconsciously on all the kind of cultural aspects we've talked about, you know, philosophy, etc. But my God, it very quickly developed its cliches and its tropes and its posturing. And I get sent a lot of books written down 99% by men about the music of the 60s, 70s, 80s. And many of them still can't escape from the gestures that they were making, the kind of hyperbolic, overblown, theatrical, clever boy gestures they were making back then that I, at the time, thought were incredibly, you know, clever. Um, but I agree that, I mean, Lester Bangs was, he's a person apart, and I think a lot of them were trying to be Lester Bangs, but didn't understand you can't be Lester Bangs unless you're Lester Bangs. Um, so I'm quite resistant to the conventions of writing about contemporary music, um, contemporary pop music. Uh, actually, that's, I mean, I'm only writing about pop, rock, whatever. I, and you get these books and they have these ridiculously overheated titles. You open the first page and it's a, the most florid sentence. Um, and, and it just, just annoys me um, or exhausts me. But a book, to give you an example of two really good books, three, actually three things, okay. Um, Carrie Brownstein's book, Hunger Made Me a Modern Girl, Sita Kinney, the band. Um, that she's in her book about about getting into a band is fantastic. Um, hun yeah, Hunger Made Me a Modern Girl. And um, Janice Galloway, who I believe you had here, um, her novel Clara about Clara Schumann, I think, is a masterpiece. And as an expression of music within the description of a musical narrative, I think it's extraordinary. Um, and the guy who used to be the New Yorker pop critic and now writes independently, Sasha Frere Jones, is an extraordinary writer on music um, from whom you always learn more than you do just about music. Uh, that's uh, quite a naive question, but David asked us to be naive, so... <laughs> uh, uh, Lavinia and Glyn just uh, uh, talked about the specific moment in history we live through, with uh, Trump and Brexit and the uh, rise of populism all over Europe uh, and uh, racism and hatred and so on and on and on. Uh, do you feel that music at this moment is still capable to, uh, to oppose, the, to stand against this hatred and anger and fear and on and on and on? Well, I, I agree with Diana that it's part of music's job to do that. Um, I also think, you know, we're talking about popular music. I'm now in my 50s. I'm, I think it's a, a younger generation's game. It doesn't mean I'm not interested, but I don't think it's for me to kind of predict or, or kind of convey what that music might now be doing. But I do think that it's part of its job to try to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Lavinia, I'm maybe a little bit past it, maybe keeping up with that at this point, but I do think, historically, at moments of cultural and political stress, this is when new art forms are generated in order to deal with it and oppose it, 
Um, and so I think, yes, I think the possibility is still there. And as Diana said, musically it is incredibly perfect, incredibly so. So, yes, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, and I think the, the way that um, young people who are forming their artistic minds and practices now, that they're so close to um, polit political sort of danger and, and oppression now, it's so much a part of our lives now that, um, you know, we see it in the way artists, like, you know, very kind of corny pop artists, like Ariana Grande, who, who has this connection now to the political well, because of the terrorist attack on the Manchester Arena, where she was uh, going to be performing, and so so there's this kind of political edge to her work now. Um, the other day, Rennie at Ed a lodge who wrote "Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race," which has been a huge um, book in in the UK in terms of how we talk about race. Uh, she was tweeting the other day about uh, girls, little mix had been talking about how big the impact uh, had been on them of reading this book. And, you know, there's there's celebrities all over the place now talking about um, these um, uh, political, uh, this political material in the arts. So, uh, and I think artists are just gonna feel more and more this, this natural urgency for expressing themselves politically, there's, there's just no getting away from it now. I think we have a duty to, in our everyday lives, not just as artists, we, we, we need to be political beings now. Can I make a, can, can I make a slightly contrary point as well though? I mean, I still believe in the relatively untouched utopia of childhood, and when I hear about uh, pop stars that young people are in, immediately talking about politics, I think it would be nice if children had a little bit of a protected time where they weren't immediately politicised, you know what I mean? Where they were actually allowed to enjoy pop music as pop music, you know? Because I think that childhood, there's an aspect of childhood where it should be sheltered off from this a little bit. There is a time and a place for politics, we'll get old enough to deal with it, but I, would, I still think it's important to have uncomplicatedly joyful, celebratory pop music that is not of a political conscience for kids. Thank you. Uh, do you have questions? This is last call, last uh, 15 or 20 minutes, uh, last chance to talk to our beautiful guests. Natasha. Okay. Thank you for brilliant discussions. It's the last <laughs> opportunity to say thank you to all of you. Uh, I want to continue the topic of dead poets and dead musicians. So if speaking of drinks with dead musicians, or maybe wider rock concerts and so on, which, uh, what concert of um, dead or alive musicians you would, you, you want uh, for surely visit, maybe it was your, uh, the concert that you've uh, already visited or maybe not, but uh, what um, concert you want, with all your heart you want to visit? And why? Such difficult questions. Uh, I mean, they're sort of asking us to pinpoint particular, you know, like our best this or our, you know, I find that really difficult. Um, no, it's hard to pressure. Yeah, it, it's hard to, yeah. Um, somebody else wants to answer first. Uh, I was quite upset when I found out Leonard Cohen had died because I, I, I had been on the cusp of seeing him, but I never got to see him, so um, he's the one I pick. To see. Um, I was going to see the Velvet Underground, but then I remembered that I actually did see them because they reformed and they played at Edinburgh Playhouse around right about 1996 or something like that, and I saw them read many, many times. Um, uh, I kind of, although I love punk and post punk, I'm kind of like a happy at heart. You know, my house is like a happy crash pad. I love like um, I love that whole San Francisco scene and stuff like that. So I would love to go back to San Francisco around about, say, 67, Summer of Love, and I'd love to see a bill at the, one of the big ballrooms there with like the Grateful Dead, Quicksilver Messenger Service, Jefferson Airplane, all these kind of side groups. Because again, this was another moment of cultural revolution. I absolutely love it, and I love the jam. 
I love it comes from loving the improvised music. I love the endless three hour jam concerts that the dead would play. So I'd love to go back to that. Not just to hear the music, but just to experience the vibe. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think what comes to mind is uh, when I, I grew up in Camden Town in London and then moved up to the country when I was 11. Um, and in Camden Town, I can remember when I was about 10 that um, I'd walk past this venue called the Roundhouse where I used to go with this music, children's music group and do things. Um, and at the end of the day, and I would get glimpses of the glam rock scene, the folk scene, particularly David Bowie and Mark Bowen, just at the point where they were beginning to become stars. And I had a sense, and, and I would see the audience, and I would see this extraordinary, I, again, the, the kind of androgyny. I mean, with punk and, um, and with glam, one of the things that attracted me was, um, and with the new romantics later, was this kind of um, moment of androgyny. Um, and these very feminine men with makeup and so on. And I, I do think that, um, I always thought that I will, in a couple of years, be old enough to go in and hear these people. And then we moved out to Essex, and they moved on from the Roundhouse, and I never heard either of them. Uh, I would ask about Anthem. Uh, if you will have to uh, choose an anthem of your own. Uh, what song would you choose? And uh, the second part about anthem, uh, have you ever uh, heard a Russian anthem? And what do you feel and what you remember? Uh, if not, we can yeah. sing it. <laughs> sing it. Uh, I have heard the Russian anthem. I can't sing it to you. Um, I think that do I have an anthem? Um, I'm not an inherently upbeat person, but a song that feels like a sort of pulse for me is Eddie Floyd's version of Bring It On Home, which will always um, make me happy. It's not really an anthem, but what it kind of is. It gets me out of bed. Um, there's a saxophonist called Albert Baylor. Um, he, he, he died in the 1970s. Um, he played sort of free jazz, but what he kind of did was he used sort of very simplistic sort of folk motifs that almost sounded like uh, national anthems. He used a little snippets of like the French national anthem and things like this. So he played these little simple figures, and then he would riff off into like uh, sort of like it was sort of free jazz meets sort of anthemic marching band music. Quite an amazing combination. And he had this wonderful track called "The Truth Is Marching In." And I think Albert Ewers, The Truth Is Marching In, would definitely be my anthem. I have heard the Russian uh, national anthem. I can't say it's one of my favourites, but it's alright. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're not really anthems, but they're, they're two uh, songs uh, that, that I always return to and I can listen to again and again and again. Um, and they're J Jimmy Cliff's Many Rivers to Cross and Sam Cooke's version of um, The Change Is Gonna Come, both, both of which have so much hope in them, but also um, so much acknowledgement of, of struggle, and, and there's a lot of joy, and they both feature um, water and, and rivers, which um, water has a lot of resonance for me uh, uh, artistically. So, uh, yeah, those would be my anthems, if I was gonna choose one or two. Do you two think about what you want played at your funeral like I do? <laughs> yes, um, Mr. Bojangles. All right. Because yeah. as well as Earth, Wind and Fire, that's the way of the world, I want um, Pergolesi, Stubber, Marta, the entire thing played live, performed live, no pressure. Let you do Well, but actually, it's funny, you see, the, the track I just picked, actually, Truth is Marching In, by Albert Eeyore, um, or something heavenly and celestial and beautiful and, and also surrendered about the music, and um, it's, it's a music of sort of um, celebrating while also kind of letting go, and it seems like the perfect uh, funeral music to me. What about you? <laughs> I wasn't ready for this question. <laughs> uh, 
I have a uh, Russian answer. Yes, I, 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 no, 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 no. I have uh, several songs uh, which I which which I feel is uh, uh, as my own, as similar to my essence in a way, and uh, I can remember. Uh, it's also a, quite a naive choice, but uh, it's Cocteau Twins and the first song from the album um, Blue Ball Mall, 1988. Uh, uh, this kind of ethereal, bittersweet, sad and uh, out of this world song. It's quite a bossy thing, though, to, to expect people to play a particular song at your funeral. I mean, what, what would you do? I do. Your funeral? It's my funeral. Is it in your will? Do you put it in your will? I mean, how do you make sure they're going to play it? So what if put they it in your will? <laughs> or just like me, keep telling them. <laughs> Dear speakers, first of all, thank you very much for the really very interesting and sincere answers. And the question is about Yesne Palan, actually. What melodies, what music, actually, does it bear in your mind, this place, when you, like, walk the bars of the story? Like, so, what, what do you think of you? <laughs> what do you have in your hands? Yeah, thank you. What music brings to mind Yasnaya Polyana for you as you walk the path to breakfast? <laughs> Do you see dancing queen? Yeah. <laughs> I think I will forever be associated in my mind with dancing queen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, ditto. Yeah. Yeah. We, we say the anthem of Yasna Poliana is dancing queen. Today we have a chance to change the tune. <laughs> Thank you very much for everything. Uh, my question is a bit philosophical. Uh, Lavinia, you said that it is more escape than expression. However, for me, a form, including music, is definitely connected with expression. So why do we need form for escape? Uh, well, we need a vehicle. We need an instrument. Um, I, think, uh, I think I was trying to distinguish between simple expression, because yes, any um, production, our artistic production is expression um, and the need within the process of making the poem or writing the song to uh, set yourself aside. You start within yourself and then you move out of yourself and that is the escape from the self. But the, the work you produce should always be anchored deep in the self. But the poet Rainer Maria Rilke has a, a sentence in his letters to a young poet where he talks about going to the roots of the tree in your heart. And it was one of those things that it took me about 20 years of pondering to, to figure out what I think he might mean, which is that art is about essential experience. So you go to your heart, you start in your heart, you start with yourself, but something has grown there and taken shape, so you're not just getting hold of abstract feelings, you're working with something formed, memory, association, narrative, whatever, uh, an emblem, something, something has formed. Um, but you don't just work with that, you go to the roots of that. Um, you go deeper than the subject to the experience that your reader will connect with. Okay, if music helps us to express feelings, yeah, or to feel deeper or something, can music be separated from uh, feelings? Can music express something like pure music, I mean, something like indifference? Or if music can't express, uh, or if music should express feelings, can it express all feelings, like hatred? Or if it can't without words, so in such cases we need, as Lavinia, you said, Sometimes we need a perfect marriage of words and music. Sometimes music, only music doesn't work. So can music do everything? Yes.
conversations. Thank you very much for that. And um, Lavinia, actually, I would love uh, to address a question to you, and um, it's related to, to the importance of music to girls. Uh, thank you, huge thank you for that amazing book. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's such a gift for everybody who loves music, and it's really beautiful and uh, vivid and brings uh, hours of joy. And um, can I put that on the back <laughs> <the> next? <laughs> <laughs> and my question is actually related to one of uh, my favorite passages of your book. Um, I think you remember your younger years, and um, you said that the greatest act of uh, love was to make a tape for somebody. And this was the only way to, um, to share the music and to advertise yourself. Uh, the track list, um, the choice, the artwork uh, followed, and uh, everything, or just the artwork. And it was like the codified uh, uh, Victorian bouquet, so you could advertise yourself. So the question is, um, nowadays when we have uh, obviously become sort of victims of sharing the music via Spotify and Apple Music and all this stuff, do you think or do you find there is uh, anything emotionally equal to uh, preparing the, the tape for somebody, so to advertise yourself as a Victorian bouquet? <laughs> I am a Victorian PK. <laughs> My name is a Victorian PK. <laughs> um, I think that music can still do all of those things, and I don't want to be nostalgic or, or sentimental about these wonderful concrete forms we had, you know, the mixtape, the cassette, because they were really hard work in lining up the it's tracks. Like the ritual, actually. In, sorry? like a ritual. Yes, and, and, and I think that rituals and taking time to make something you give somebody is important. Um, I love making mixtapes for people, but I do it now as a playlist. And it does feel, it, it's quite dangerous because you can, um, you can move too quickly, you can, you can kind of shuffle around. It's like writing on a computer anyway. You, know, you're, you can very quickly edit and things get deleted and you get lost. Um, you asked me what the equivalent of the Victorian bouquet is now. Ooh. I don't know. I really don't know how because I'm because I'm not I'm not advertising myself anymore. I don't well, I mean, what could it be so <laughs> to get you astonished probably? To to astonish me. Yeah. Um I think if uh is anything that showed somebody was listening to me, actually. I think that was the thing about music. Um, it was very tempting to make a tape that was your favorite music and you wanted other people to listen to it, but the art was thinking about who they were and what they might like. And I think if somebody gave me anything, music or anything, that they would put together or chosen with that kind of care, that level of care and attention, I would be deeply moved, yes. Thank you. Um, I would like to know if your musical tastes have changed at a certain point in your life, if they changed at all. Do you still listen to the same thing as when you were teenagers? Or how, why? At what point was there a crucial turning point when your musical tastes changed? Um, I mean, my mum always complains about me that I never, I'm the same person I was when I was 16 years old. You know, she's like, you like the same stuff, act the same way, or doing the same stuff you were doing when you were about 16, which is probably true. But my tastes have changed quite a lot. I, I've, I've, I mean, I listen, when I'm at home, I listen to Radio 3. You know, which is a weird thing for me to do. Um, I started listening to a lot more of classical music. I really like early music. Uh, I love Bach. Um, and when I was younger, I definitely would never have listened to Radio 3 and certainly wouldn't be listening to early music. So I still listen to all the stuff I liked before, but I've definitely expanded into other areas that I would probably never have imagined myself listening to, yes. Yeah, me too. I, I'm, I feel like I'm just slightly the same classical music now, or, or wanting to explore it more. Um, and I, I, I have less patience with, with pop music than I used to. 
And, um, but I also feel myself reverting back to my early music as well because it feels that I, I feel that there's so much substance there and, and it helps me, um, I don't know, to connect to who I am and the things that I really believe in. And, um, so yeah, it has changed and it is changing, but that there's a staple, there's an unmoving staple that I think I'll always return to as a form of connecting with identity. Yeah, I feel the same really, that um, all that music is still there and I listen to it, but there are long periods of time when I can't bear to listen to it because I can't bear to have those feelings. And I, I'm, I'm writing something at the moment about not listening and why I at times just don't have, uh, this may sound a little melodramatic, but it's true that there are feelings I, I don't have, I can't bear to have. And I don't just mean negative feelings, I just mean the intensity um, and so I, I think, shall I listen to that? No. Um, but like the others, I'm much more relaxed and wide-ranging in my taste than I was as a fanatical 16-year-old where I took all my disco records and gave them to the children I babysat for and then forgot all the pictures of me as a disco girl and burnt them. Um, and. Uh, I was absolutely terrified that any of my punk friends would discover. But I did, I did hide in the back of my wardrobe certain key records, you know, Marvin Gaye, various things that, that, that were, were held on to. But it was so lovely watching my daughter grow up and her just reaching across all these different musics and not worrying about it, just in the same way that we all felt we had to dress alike to some extent. And my daughter and her friends all have their own style. Um, yeah. Any questions? Yeah. What, uh, what is uh, British uh, music today? And could you name uh, Sarah? Ask an under 30 year old. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you listen to new artists and singers, or how uh, could you name? No. <laughs> I. Yeah. I think the, the last band who really interests me is that uh, two young women have a band called Let's Eat Grandma, which I actually think is a silly name, and it distracts you because they're actually brilliant. But it's a, I think it, they probably came up with that name when they were 15, and now they're kind of 18, 17, 18, they, they might realise it's not a good name. Um, but they are doing something very new and original, well not, I mean, the new and original are very loaded terms, but it feels fresh, it feels like nothing I've heard before, um, and it feels it comes out of the same philosophy, the same background as our kind of DIY, do it upstairs in your bedroom, you haven't got much equipment, you're kind of making it up as you go along. Um, so they interest me, but I also think that these, um, you know, the, the, the London, the London music, that we've got, which is so politically engaged now, is very important as well. Artists like Stormzy, etc., um, becoming very powerful and a counterpoint to the inanities of pop. But I couldn't tell you who is in the charts or. No, I haven't got a clue. Yeah, I mean, I don't really follow the charts much anymore, but I do agree that the the British kind of hip hop and reggae movements are where the, the most kind of interesting stuff is happening. I mean, I was, I was being slightly facetious when I said no. I mean, I do still listen to a lot of new music. Katrina Barbieri has got a great album called Ecstatic Computation. It's a lot of analog synth and electronics, a really amazing record that came out this year. But um, for, I, I ran a record shop for 10 years. I ran my own record shop and we only stopped things that we liked because I couldn't bear to recommend a record to someone that I didn't wholeheartedly believe was worth their time hearing. And so with that in mind, I was an absolute fanatic. I scoured the world for interesting underground stuff. I always liked stuff that was in handmade packaging, cassettes, limited edition CDRs, limited vinyl, stuff like that. And I, was, I sent out a newsletter every week where I reviewed every single record that came into our shop. And over 10 years, I wrote a million words in terms of reviews of radical, experimental, underground music. So to be honest with you, 
I feel as if I really sort of paid my dues and I quite like not keeping up anymore because I spent so much of my life fanatically searching out all of this radical under the radar music and I'm now quite happy to hand that job over to someone else. The Perry Como years now. Exactly. It's easy to listen, it's Como for life at this point. <laughs> I'll try to. What do you think about streaming services, about algorithms uh, that uh, uh, for offering the uh, uh, playlists and the music similar to the music you like? How does it change the perception of the music when uh, not our friends, not our parents, but some artificial intelligence try to uh, uh, try to bring us, uh, in fact, the same music that we've already uh, listened to. Yeah, I think I think it's they're not helpful. Um, I do think that there is a problem in that uh, music online is vast, and we do look for ways through it. We do look for guidance and suggestions, but coming from algorithms um, is generally just annoying. I mean, when I went into the record shop, I would chat to the guy, I would just chat to him about music. We'd talk, and he'd look, and he'd see who I was and what I was interested in, and T.S. Eliot sticking out of my pocket. And he would just sort of go, oh, I think you might like this. And it wasn't obvious. It didn't have a connection to the thing I bought last week. It was a very complex judgment. And then nothing gave me more pleasure. It's like with a good bookshop, someone who knows you a little bit and just says, oh, I think you might like this. I mean, I always talk about the idea of the quest. And I think one of the things that we've lost through the streaming and algorithms and the easy access to music is the aspect of the quest. Because at the start of a real device, someone says, well, it's not, it's not even about the music anymore. Because one of the things about, um, I remember the first time I went to London, and going into rough, legendary rough trade records. And this was the quest. I had to get the train with my mum and we took, I was allowed to bring a friend on holiday. We went into the rough trade shop. We were playing this abrasive of noise really loudly. We were nervous little kids. We approached the counter. We bought some records. The guy behind the desk I later became friends with, Nigel, said, oh, if you like that, you should probably pick up this record. You might be into this. Afterwards, we went down into the public toilet outside Rough Trade and I bought some marijuana for the first time ever. We then went up and smoked it in a park. We then went into a gig at night that we were underage for. So it was all these aspects of searching out music took you down into all these adventures, the quest. So I think when you can easily just pull it up on your iPhone and it recommends you music, well, you're missing out on a hell of a lot of adventure, you know? <laughs> I think that's partly why I'm, I've been returning to, to earlier music because of um, because that, that quest of wanting to find my own way back and I don't necessarily, when I download things, I don't actually take much notice of what is suggested to me I, um, because usually it's, it sends me back to what I really want to hear so I, I will, I don't think we ever lose our sense of um, our own identity, our artistic identities. We know what we want to hear, despite the algorithm rhythms and, and the suggested playlists. We, we still have our own independence of thought, you know? So um, we can maintain our own quests. Uh, I'd like to add uh, a few words, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that you didn't ask me. Because uh, 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 for me, the best recommendation system is uh, uh, visiting the good music shops. When you visit the good music shop, either Rough Trade in London or uh, other music in New York or Transylvania in Moscow, uh, there is always some beautiful song playing in this shop of a completely unknown band. 
that you fell in love with immediately. Uh, and you buy the CD or a vinyl and you go out absolutely happy. Uh, how do they do it? I don't know. <laughs> and then when you get home... But it's the best algorithm I've ever seen. Uh, sadly, it's passing away at the moment, but, uh, but the hope still lives on. Thank you. I'd like to thank our guests. Thank you for spending this time with us, for sharing your thoughts, your feelings, your art, your poetry, and your passion. Thank you so much. All the people from Jasna Palyana and from the Shandu Street who made this possible. the depth of your engagement with our work, your interrogation of us, um, everything has been incredibly enriching and encouraging for us all. And I would like to thank everybody who has made it possible. The British Council, Jim Hinks, with whom I had the first conversations, who's very, very carefully put the whole thing together. said who I want to organize my life. <laughs> Doing the hardest work with the lightest touch and always on top of everything. I knew um, when I recommended or we talked about different writers for this and you know these are the jewels that, in the crown of who we could have brought with us. Um, I felt a great responsibility to them and I knew from the first conversations I had with Lydia and Jim that they would be in safe hands and that takes us to Tatiana and Yulia and everybody at the Embassy, at the British Council, at Yasnaya Polyana. We do not underestimate how much work, how much time, how much commitment and we know also you know, that there have been great difficulties and sensitivities around the work that the British Council and the Embassy have insisted on, you know, and you have insisted on this happening because you have wanted to come back. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a huge amount to say. I think I've learned so much from being here. Um, and I, I kind of suppose I want to just echo some of what Amelia said, which is that uh, these are some of the best questions I've ever heard, um, and I was writing them down. I wish I could credit you um, for when I then uh, repeat them in, in my own life back in Britain. But I think it's been one of the, 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 the richest and, and most wonderful, actually, experiences that I've had, where it feels like a genuine cultural exchange. Um, and I, I, I kind of hope to come back as well, like I said to some people, my, my image of Russia was this vast, <laughs> empty land. <laughs> Uh, and then it was still alive. Uh, that's completely wrong. I know. But it, 
it's so nice to come here and uh, have such a lovely walk and also speak with such a lovely people. I, I, I don't think I've really spoken to any of you before, and now it feels like we're all like, very good friends, uh, friends with you all too. So thank you so much. I echo everything that Lavinia has said, and of course that Jade has said, and it's been an incredible, humbling privilege to be here. And I can only say that in all the time I've been doing what I do, no one has ever asked me why I do it, or how I do it. <laughs> and you've been absolutely interested in a way that has, has been, has stimulated me to go on doing it, so thank you. I completely echo what everyone else has said, but I would also like to thank uh, Lavinia for, for all her hard work, <laughs> and me, amazing stamina, um, and also for her incredible vision of putting us all together. I mean, we're a very disparate bunch, we do very different things, but somehow it's been an absolute joy, and we've all worked together so well, and it's been so easy between all of us. Can we go on tour? Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> this is like a classic lineup, the best band ever. <laughs> and um, it was, it's been a very magical experience for me, oddly enough, my ne I set my next novel, which is coming out next summer, in, in Russia, although I'd never been there. And just when I sent my novel to the publishers, I got the offer to come to Russia. It's one of these incredible magic things that you throw out to the universe, and the universe responds in kind. And my idea of Russia was people who take culture, art, music, literature incredibly seriously, the way I talked about punk rock and discovering that culture in my time. And you've proven me right. Your seriousness, your commitment, your degree of interest, the amazing questions, the enthusiasm, it's, it's exactly what I thought it would be, and even more so. And I don't take any of this for granted. I feel that my dreams came true to be a writer and to be able to come to Russia and talk about my novels has been absolutely humbling and amazing. So thank you, everyone, so much. It means a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important And it's, it, it's, it's been so well organised and I love the fact that we've been able to go to museums and it was a very special thing for me to go to home. That, that was one of the, the best experiences in my writing life. So thank you for organising our own sort of artistic <coughs> enrichment around our work here. And it's also been incredible sharing um, this, this stage with you guys. I've, I've, I feel like I've been enriched by listening to you and you're all incredible. I went uh, all around the world with the British Council in the 1990s, and then, I've told the story before, but a journalist phoned me up and, uh, and wanted to talk about the British Council, and I, I said to him that they, the, they organised the greatest trips, and I, I, I really enjoyed going on them because they, was, they, were, they were such fun, and uh, you know, we worked hard, but you know, I, I talked too much. And uh, it went, in, went into the newspaper as poet says, British Council is a holiday camp. Uh, but because they were basically trying to shut it down, because the Conservatives were trying to shut it down. So uh, I didn't get invited to do anything with the British Council for about 20 years <laughs> until, until now. So at the risk of not being invited to do anything into my late 70s, uh, I'd say they're, they're fucking holiday camp. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's it's really uh, fantastic. Thanks you to all of you, and all of you who came and all of you who helped to organise it. And I'd just like to, to say that I think perhaps um, all of us together know where the little green stick is buried.
summary of what we've been talking about here during three days. So particular thanks to Yuri Saprikin, who is a master of the talk. Full of emotions, so we made a list for not to forget forget <laughs> anything. So uh, first of all, thanks a lot for to the participants uh, of this brilliant seminar, as well as those who joined us for public events, because you are the people for whom everything is made. And, uh, we hope you uh, enjoy that and uh, you will take most of it. Uh, then one more, please give a big applause to our authors and to our chair. Um, <laughs> Russia, and particular to Yasna Panama. <laughs> then I would like to ask one person to come to the stages and please give a separate round of applause to this person because this is the person without whom we would never ever select our authors and never ever bring them to Russia. And this is a person who usually puts all his heart and soul into this project. I'm talking about Jim Hinks from British Council. <laughs> Russian Year of Music, and this project is one of the highlights, so we were very attentively, carefully uh, preparing for it, and we really enjoyed how it went, so I think I won't mistake if I say that it was, and it is a success, so uh, we hope it will repeat, not only next year, but it is an annual event, and we plan to keep moving further. Uh, so uh, thank you for making it possible. Thanks a lot to our partners in Yasnia Palena, to the whole team, Julia, Katya, Polina, uh, Sylvieta, even everybody who was involved. Thank you very much. but I will go through it still. So I would like to thank from Yasna Padana authors and Lavinia and Jim for bringing this wonderful team of authors to Yasna Padana and spending this time with us. And I'd like to thank uh, the cultural and education section of the British Embassy. I still need to write it, not to say British Council. Uh, for idea, Tanya, about making literature and music. I know I was the most doubtful about the idea, but now I say that it was a great success and that it is wonderful to bring literature and music together on one stage. Anya for showing this and still showing this to more people and live streaming and to Michael for promising three years ago to make it a new event and keeping his promise and I still hope to have several more. everyone to Lydia who is always <laughs> energy. I'd like to thank uh, all the participants who shaped the seminar because with every other new participant it's the other seminar we are having and for your contribution because it also changes the seminar. I would like to say special thank to Yasna Palana team and to Katya who was real engine of this seminar while everyone else was dying and the Tolstoy we confessed to she was also dying but still managing to prepare <laughs> the other seminar to Igor. Without whom we wouldn't have light, sound, video, and what is maybe most important, we wouldn't have yesterday's disco party. <laughs> is our best volunteer helping Yasne Palan with each festival and seminar and to Sveta whose pictures are always not just for uh, so many people 
also behind the stage that we don't see, but who took care about our um, food and room and tour. And I would also say a uh, final thank you to Yuri Saprikin, who made, uh, I think, special final discussion, which was one of the most successful discussions ever. Thank you. Thank you. journalists who are spreading the word and to Anastasia who brought them here. <laughs> so what's next? So uh, now we'll be giving you certificates proving that you really did take part in this <laughs> seminar together with acts of acceptance which you need to sign and give back either to Kasia or to me or to Julia or to any person with red page. After that, I would suggest a usual traditional group picture in front of this building, and then uh, the bus will be arranged to go to dinner, which will be at 7 instead of 7.30, so that the quiz could begin at 8.